Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Joel Rosenberg. Good evening, everyone. For those of you that I have not met yet, my name is Joanne Drake, and I serve as the Chief Administrative Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. It is our tradition here to ask you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance in honor of the men and women who wear our uniform around the world. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And thank you all for coming this evening. I think it's going to be a special evening. You know, my guess is that if you are here this evening, it is because you already are a fan of Joel Rosenberg. Because... <laughs> My guess is, like me, you bought one of his books after a friend or neighbor recommended it. Then, two minutes after finishing it, you clicked into Amazon <laughs> and ordered a second book for next day delivery, which then led to a third, fourth, fifth, and well, now you own every one of his fiction series and maybe even a copy of his five nonfiction books. They are gripping. They are most definitely thrilling. At times, they are very scary, and they are on the bestseller list every single day. In his spare time while not writing, if he's not home watching reruns of Seinfeld, I hear, <laughs> Joel can be found speaking to audiences in cities and countries, large and small, around the world. And not just about books. Joel has been invited to speak with religious and government leaders from across the globe including addressing members of Congress in Washington, D.C., members of the Canadian Parliament in Ottawa, and at a conference at the European Union Parliament in Brussels. There, he spoke about present-day world politics, terrorism, and connections to the Bible, both Old and New Testament. But he is a writer, not an elected leader, and not even a politician which may actually explain why the President of Egypt and the King of Jordan invited Joel to bring a group of evangelical Christians to a meeting with non-Christian religious leaders in each of their non-Christian countries. I want you to think about that. Perhaps he will share a story or two from those adventures this evening. It is clear that Joel knows a lot of people in various governmental and security agencies around the world. Due to those relationships and the many books he has written as a result, he has gained a great deal of credibility over the years. Whether he's talking about or writing about the nuclear showdown with Israel and Iran and the US and North Korea and Russia, or economic and social challenges in those countries, or the conflict throughout the Middle East, and of course, how much of that is reflected in the scriptures. As many of you know, Joel's first political thriller, The Last Jihad, was published in November 2002. Prior to that time, Joel had never been on national television. But of course, the book garnished hundreds of interview requests. Why? Because everyone wanted to know how someone could have written a novel that opened with a plane hijacked by radical Islamists, terrorists flying a kamikaze attack into an American city that then led to a war between the US and Iraq over terrorism and weapons of mass destruction. As Joel has told hundreds of interviewers, he began writing that book nine months before September 11th and finished the book before any of it ever happened in real life. How was Joel Rosenberg then, and still today, able to predict real life events in advance of their occurrence? Is he? as some have called him, a modern Nostradamus? How does he manage to write novels that are ripped from tomorrow's headlines? 
I will let him answer those questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Joel Rosenberg to our stage. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, welcome. I think uh, your guests tonight, I hope they came with a lot of good questions. I'm guessing most of them have read at least some of those books. I got a, I got a nod when I mentioned it. Now, your newest book, The Persian Gamble, is currently, I just found out, now on four national bestseller lists in the United States. Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Now, I saw in a recent interview that you did on CBN that you summed up this very timely and very alarming novel, I might add, like this. North Korea has almost 60 nuclear warheads. What if Iran takes the $150 billion that President Obama gave them and secretly goes to North Korea to try and buy several? The punchline here is that you were providing that summary in a special place for an unusual audience. Your summary was not just an exciting premise for a book, but it's a world, real world situation right now. So tonight, can you tell us to whom were you speaking and where? And is it really that simple? Is it plausible? And if so, what can we do about that? Well, Joanne, thank you, first of all. Thank you all for coming. I don't maybe thought someone else was coming <laughs> more interesting, but you're nice to, to turn out to the Reagan Library tonight to, to hear this conversation. I'm honored to be here, never been here before, so it really is very special. Uh, well, yes, so as I was getting the, the tour today of the Reagan Library, uh, we stepped into the Oval Office, and the lovely woman that was giving me the tour said, you know, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to see the Oval Office. I said, well, a month ago I would have said no, but three weeks ago I had the opportunity to be invited to meet with President Trump in the Oval Office, and this is who asked me, so I understand you have a new novel out, uh, give me the elevator pitch. And that's what I said. I said, it's, you know, uh, you know, what if the Iranian regime took the $150 billion that President Obama gave them for agreeing to what I believe is, is an ins insane nuclear deal, completely useless. Uh, what if they took that money and secretly went to North Korea and tried to buy off-the-shelf, fully operational nuclear warheads? At which point, the president, sitting behind the Resolute desk, uh, says to me, wow, well, how do you know Iran's not doing that already? Now, you have to picture the scene. Uh, I'm, I, my wife and I have been friends with Mike and Karen Pence for, for many years. He's been a reader of the novels. And that's why I was at the uh, White House that day. Mm -hmm. I was having lunch with him. I bring him his and her copies of the novels now. <laughs> I met them when, they were, uh, when he was in the smart. House of Representatives. Yes. And so over the years, we would send them advanced copies. But when he became governor, I noticed one year when I went to see him, I asked him if he'd read the new one. He said, well, I mean, Karen, she gets it. He wasn't complaining, but it was clear that he had not seen the book yet. <laughs> it had not quite gotten to him yet. So when he became vice president, I said, listen, you're the second most powerful man in the world. I really think you guys deserve you know, your own books separate. You know, I don't want to create any tension there in that marriage. <laughs> So anyway, so I, that's why I was there, and he said, have you ever met the president? I said, I've never even set foot in the Oval Office, and that's what happened. And when we went in there, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was there, as well as John Bolton, uh, the National Security Advisor. So, you had uh, quite an audience. It was quite an audience, <laughs> and, I, and I really felt like the old Sesame Street cartoon, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of these things just doesn't belong. <laughs> So we're sitting there, and yeah, and that's what, and, and so he said, so how do you know that Iran's never, you know, not doing this now? I said, well, Mr. President, I'm, I'm trusting that you and the men in this room <laughs> are making sure this book never comes true, you know, so let's, let's pray to God that that And, and did he give true. you an answer? Uh, he did not give me an answer. I think the context was interesting, right? He'd just been to Hanoi. Uh, three of the five people in that room had been to Hanoi trying to get the North Koreans to give, to give up that, uh, their nuclear program and enter the world economic system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that the president had walked away from uh, what was a lousy offer uh, struck me as very Reagan-esque. Uh, and that uh, you have your objective, you want to get there, and somebody says, I'll give it to you as long as... And then there's always that, uh, right. that little clause at the end, and you're like, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Shades yeah. of Reykjavik. Yeah, that's not going to happen. So um, I, I, I had to, the president also asked me, tell me a little about yourself. And I said, well, should I? Shouldn't I? OK, I will. <laughs> I, you know, this is probably the only time I'll be here. So I said, Mr. President, I have to tell you that I was a never Trumper until the Thursday before the election. <laughs> now, how many times do you think the, ter the term never Trumper comes up in the current Oval Office? I mean, I'm, <laughs> the look in his eye suggested not that many, not that many. times. <laughs> But he went with it. I mean, there was Secret Service present. Uh, he did, I, I'm here with you today, so you can infer that I made it. But the point is, he says, he, he, he sort of took the bait, as it were, and he said, so what happened on the Thursday before the election? And I said, well, uh, we're dual U.S.-Israeli citizens. Uh, and uh, don't tell Congresswoman Omar, but we, have, we love both of our countries. We're loyal to both of our countries. But anyway, that's a separate issue. Uh, I said, so we had to send, on our, send in our FedEx absentee ballot on a Thursday to get there by the following Tuesday. So we had to make a decision. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm telling to the president. And I said, so I'd been against you the whole election, but my wife said, listen, we're not going to vote for her, right? I said, no, we're not. So I think I can say that at the, Re the Reagan Library, right? <laughs> is, that, is that OK? <laughs> right, it's, I'm sure it's a nonpartisan environment, but you know, <laughs> yeah. So, I, so, so my wife said, so this is it. It's, it's him or her. Write it down right now. We've got to send it. She said, your challenge is that you don't trust Mr. Trump to keep any of the conservative promises that he's made. And I said, well, that's true. That's why I'm struggling with this. She said, well, OK, well. And did you, you tell him that? I, that's what I'm, this, I'm telling the exact story that okay. I told him. And, and did you walk further No, no, further I'm, I'm sitting. We're, we're, we're <laughs> sitting, and he's behind the desk, and, and I. I say, so at this point, my wife says to me, we got to vote for him. We, we can trust her to keep all of her promises. That's, that's, the, that's the problem. Yes. And we're going to have to trust him to try to keep some of them. But one last thing, she says, Joel, you and I have been friends with Mike and Karen Pence for many years. Are you really planning to vote against a ticket where someone has read your books and likes them? That's your plan? <laughs> Well, that got him laughing, and all of them laughing, and that sort of softened it. And then I thanked him. You know, look, I still disagree with him on a lot of things, but I gave him a list of about eight different promises that he's made that are huge that he's made. Scrapping the Iran nuclear deal, imposing, reimposing sanctions on Iran, moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem after everybody said they would and nobody ever did. Vast, another Reagan-esque move to vastly increase this spent investment on U.S. defense spending and so forth, the biggest tax cut and tax reform since the Reagan years. I mean, this is pretty good from a president that I, you know, I just sort of shield my eyes from the Twitter feeds and, you know, I, there's some issues I got. Some good Supreme Court. Some very good, oh, pro-life, great Supreme Court justices. I mean, it was, it's a long list. And, and if there was one of those things on the list, it would have been longer than I thought. So um, it, was a, it was a good conversation. We had good. A, yeah, and I enjoyed meeting him. So did you talk much about Iran? Because I, I guess did, I wonder, yeah. through this book and through your other series, The Twelfth Imam, you know, what, what's Iran's end game here? What is it they're looking yeah. for? Well, I think this premise of this uh, Iran's duplicity of agreeing to a deal. Do you realize the Iran nuclear agreement wasn't even signed? I mean, it's kind of interesting, you know, we say that they got $150 billion for, I have to say, agreeing to, because they didn't actually even have to sign. I believe someone said, how does it go? Trust, but verify. <laughs> if you, if you don't even ask the, the other team, your worst enemy, I might add, to sign, we're not even talking about basic commitments, right? And this is a deal that's just uh, basically asks them we're not, we don't, we can't do snap inspections. We can't look at every site in your country the moment we want to. And you don't even have to dismantle your entire nuclear industry. But we're asking you to just delay making enough nuclear fuel that could build an arsenal of nuclear weapons for 10 to 15 years. That is not, um, I, I, I just see that as punting but it doesn't end the game. It doesn't dismantle the system. So 
I, I really, th and what you've got in, in North Korea is a situation where North Korea has between 24 and 60 fully operational nuclear weapons. They do all this testing, nobody's planning to attack them or invade them. So, in a sense, you've got a starving population in North Korea. Uh, the North Korean regime is starved for cash. They're under severe economic sanctions. They're cut off from most of the global economy. And so they have the weapons and they have ICBMs that can reach at least to here. So, and they're desperate for cash. Iran has cash. This is not just in his book. No, that's, what, that's, the, that's, that's how I get to writing a novel like this, is say, what's really happening? And then let's imagine it forward. Let's consider a worst case scenario. But in a case where Iran wants those weapons and wants ICBMs that can reach the United States, this is a match made in hell, right? And so that, that's the challenge of being a thriller writer, is to write a political th thriller with a premise that is not true, but is just terrifying enough and plausible enough that a person might plunk down 28 bucks. Well, not me, I'm Jewish, I, I, I don't pay retail, but... So, you know, 15 bucks. Right. It's worth 15 bucks. Okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what they're charging here, but, uh, you know, but anyway, on Amazon. But anyway, so how do you do that? And with five million sold, okay, it means you're talking to a lot of people, but how do you get the vice president and the secretary of state, the king of Jordan and others, how, why, why should they read them? So anyway, the, the key is being as plausible as possible. And yes, I think it's a very plausible situation and it's a very dangerous one. Well, speaking of your trip to the, to the meetings with the king of Jordan, Tell us a little bit about that. How did it come about? Well, so this is, uh, so sometimes life is stranger than fiction, Joanne, right? I mean, uh, you had a pretty cool life working for the president and, all, and, uh, and right up to this moment. Um, look, I'm a failed political consultant. Um, <laughs> well, you're laughing because it's not your resume. <laughs> Everyone I worked for in Washington lost or in the end decide not to run because they were just decide not, you know, whatever, not to do it. Or they did well, but it was years after I was involved, right? I worked for Jack Kemp, didn't run. Bill Bennett, didn't run. Steve Forbes, I helped him lose two presidential campaigns and about $70 million, uh, so that was. I helped Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on his comeback campaign team in 2000. It took him nine more years to come back. So <laughs> I once was on Pat Buchanan's TV show on MSNBC, they canceled it the next day. I, I began to get the sense, this may not be the career for me, right? There are so, hints of that. Yeah, yeah. So, becoming a political thriller writer, I, you know, I'd never even written a novel before The Last Jihad. So, but, it, but I wrote a trilogy a few years ago on ISIS, the Islamic State capturing chemical weapons in Syria, and then beginning to launch a series of, a, horrific attacks against regional neighbors and against the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, in that series, for some reason, I'm not that bright, Joanne. I mean, I think I've <laughs> just explained that, but I decided to make the King of Jordan, King Abdullah, an actual named character. Right. Where ISIS is trying to assassinate him, blow up his palace, take over his country, and wave the, the black flags of ISIS over Amman. Now, if you're Jewish, and an American, and an evangelical, and an Israeli, I know that's a lot to process, but, and you live next door to the king, you, it might not be a good idea <laughs> to make him a, a character that, that people are trying to assassinate. I mean, I wasn't for it. I, I wanted him to live. I'm sure he was relieved to hear yeah, that. Well, so anyway, he, so he read one of them. Now, instead of banning me from the kingdom forever, <laughs> which he could have done, he invited my wife and me for five days to come and visit with him. And we had uh, three different meetings with him and to meet his generals. And essentially, I realized he didn't say it, but over these days, I realized he's showing us what he's doing to make sure that series didn't come true, that ISIS couldn't overthrow him. We, we had lunch with him in his main official palace, the first the first thing we did when we got to the country. Uh, and he said, Joel, I, I, it's nice to meet you. I was trying to think where it would be fun to meet you for the first time. And I thought, well, since you did destroy this palace in the books, maybe you'd like to see the palace. Like, well, it's very nice. It's very nice. And I, 
you know, God forbid this ever happened. So mm -hmm. long live the king, you know. And so I've had, it's, it's been a fun relationship. And I did have the opportunity at his request to bring a delegation of evangelical leaders to meet with him. And I think we've met five times or so now. And uh, yeah, I, I admire him. But it's not often that a Jewish evangelical Israeli gets a chance to sit with a direct descendant of Muhammad, a moderate Muslim Arab king who is in a hot war against mm -hmm. these types of radicals. Uh, and I think, and he's now read the whole trilogy. Um, I brought him, he, he read the second one. I brought him copies of the first one. And the first one, I, I said, can I just show you the first page, the first sentence of the first page in the series? He said, sure. Which I, series is this? this is, so the first novel is called The Third Target. Okay. Oh. Yeah. The second, I know it's funny, is The First Hostage. And then Without Warning is the last one. So he, he had read The First Hostage because an, an advisor had, and then said, you have to read this. And he said, why? He said, because you're in it. <laughs> what do you mean I'm in it? It's a novel. I know, but you're a character. What are you talking about? So anyway, that's the one he read. So I bring him the third target. And I said, can I just show you the first sentence? And he said, sure. The first sentence right, reads, I had never met a king before. It's, it, it opens up in first person. So he laughs, pulls out a pen, and writes, well, you have now, <laughs> signs it, and gives it back. That's great. And uh, the, ne the next time I saw him, I brought him the copies of the third. And uh, I said, I didn't know if you'd want to read it. He goes, yeah, I want to see if, if I live. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't tell you. You have to read it. You have to read it. Well, you know, I uh, found a quote. Someone you might know, Ronald Reagan, 1982. And he said, peace is not the absence of conflict, but the ability to cope with conflict by peaceful means. Now, the Persian gamble focuses not just on the Middle East and radical Islam, but on a rising threat of power in Moscow. Can you tell us tonight if you think Vladimir Putin is someone we should be taking seriously, or whether you think our bigger worry should be in the Middle East? Oh, we should take Putin seriously. There's no question about that. I, I have argued and, and certainly do in the, in the Kremlin conspiracy, though I don't make the dictator in that book, I don't use him by name. Because I want to be able to drink tea and not be entirely, <laughs> you know, worried if I'm going to make it that's through fair. the day. Yeah, I, I that's fair. Eat a salad without having put plutonium sprinkled on it. It's, it's the little things, Joanne, right? That you got to... Yes. So I don't, I'm not saying that not naming him really obscures the fact that he is the character of Putin-esque. But the point is, yes, I believe that Vladimir Putin is the most dangerous man on the planet. And that even though the Iranian and North Korean regimes are, are rogue regimes, that they are dangerous because they're not predictable, they have an entirely different mindset, worldviews of, of, of of what they want for themselves at the, at the leadership level. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very different. Uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei is a very different man, a different, very different outlook from Vladimir Putin. Uh, the dear leader, Kim Jong-un in Pyongyang, entirely different personality, upbringing, worldview than the other two. But these three have formed an alliance. Now, Putin, I believe, believes that he's leading that alliance. And the other two let him think that because they want stuff from him. They, they need nuclear technology. They want advanced weapon systems. They need political cover at the UN, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, I don't, I don't think they're listening to Vladimir Putin, and, except what, what, what unifies them is a, a deep hatred of the United States and of the Western alliance. Mm -hmm. Uh, but ultimately, you still have to say that Putin is the most dangerous and the biggest threat to the United States and to NATO because he is the man who has a full-blown arsenal of nuclear weapons, the missiles to deliver them, and he has shown that he will invade neighbors um, with impunity. And so when you add that together, his support for Iran makes him very dangerous. His support for North Korea... Because if they launch or they do all kinds of other terrible things, it's with the full support so far in recent years. All the Iranian terrorism, all the North Korean shooting, testing missiles over Japan and Taiwan and all the rest. That's all with the full support of the man in Moscow. And uh, this, well, is not, the, this is not Gorbachev. No. Well, and the treaty that he's now gone against is actually in one of our galleries here. 
the treaty that Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev signed. Oh, wow. So. Yeah. He is, uh, yeah, he is the most dangerous man. And I think that uh, ultimately those three men are not accountable to anybody else in their systems. They are, um, they're feared so they're not taken out by people who have access to them. Uh, and they're... Uh, and then they're dangerous, and I'm not sure exactly if the Western Alliance really knows exactly how to, how to deal with them effectively. So getting back to the book, does uh, Mr. Putin have a son-in-law that we could count on? Uh, well. You'll have to read the book to know yeah, what you're talking so, about. Uh, let's start by saying, so the, the, the previous novel to the Persian Gamble is called The Kremlin Conspiracy. That's the beginning of the new series uh, with, a, with a, a character, Marcus Riker, who's a former Marine decorated for combat in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And he goes on to work for the United States Secret Service. I enjoyed the, all the Secret mm -hmm. Service themes here and the heroic, heroic men and women who live in sheer boredom for 99.99967% of their life, except for the moment when you're Tim McCarthy and the rest of the team uh, and those shots start getting fired. And that's just, uh, you know, just an unbelievable heroism. And you have to do it with me muscle memory because the rest of your day is just incredibly boring, right? Because things aren't happening, right? So they're not supposed to happen. <laughs> Your whole life is, please don't happen. But if they happen, I, I don't have time to think. I have to react. So God bless them. So, it, it, so the previous novel to the Persian Gamble is the Kremlin Conspiracy. Now, when I was in the Oval Office, the last thing I said to the president when we were getting a picture taken, we were waiting for the photographer to come in. And I said, I, I had this other moment, and I thought, let's just... And should I, should I? Yes, I should. <laughs> so um, I said, Mr. President, um, I just, we have another moment. Could I just tell you about the book previous to the Persian Gamble? Sure. He didn't quite know what was coming. I said, well, it's called The Kremlin Conspiracy. Now, again, you should have seen the look in his eye because <laughs> the Mueller report had not yet come out, right? So he is not yet vindicated at this moment. This is three weeks ago. I said, no, it has nothing to do with the allegations against you. It's about a Russian dictator plotting an attack against uh, the Baltic states uh, to take over these three NATO countries and, and thus unravel NATO. I said, but, I, but I, can, can, I, can I offer a suggestion? <laughs> what's, what's he going to say at this point? So we're <laughs> photographers setting up. And so he says, sure. So I said, well, here's what I recommend. Take the copy of the Kremlin conspiracy. Walk out of the Oval Office. Walk across the South Lawn. <laughs> hold it up to the press corps and say, the Kremlin conspiracy, it's fiction, people, it's fiction. <laughs> then get in Marine One and fly off, and the heads of the press will explode. Did he do it? He, he, he laughed, and he didn't do it. However, now that the Mueller feels... report is out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make the, the point to him. Again, this would be fun now. Right. It's not... You're not in jeopardy. Now it's, this Feels is just like pure something fun. he would And it would do. be great for me. So, I, you know. <laughs> it is a great book, by the way. Um, and well, It's you, not the question you asked, but you see no, how I took that and just I did. turned it to, I did. to I my did own purposes. That. So, yeah, yeah um, I'm not sure if I, I don't know how, how to answer your question without giving things away. Yeah, we have to be careful because I don't want to give them away either to, to those who have not read either The Kremlin Conspiracy or this book yet. Um, they're, they're really tremendous. But I have to tell you, they're scary. I mean, honestly, the news, it's right in here. You don't even have to turn on the news. You can read it right in here. And, I mean, it does scare me. And, you know, well, I One have... of the things I enjoy is people who, who you, you talk about confusion, people who read my novels, and what they say to me is, I can't remember what I've seen on the news and what's in your novels. Mm -hmm. Because they are, they're, they're rare in the sense that, you know, if you were reading The Lord of the Rings... I love the, you know, Tolkien. You're not going to get confused by what's happening tomorrow, right? You're like, oh, did, did they get back to the Shire? Did the orcs come? No. No, that was, oh, that was the novel. That was the movie, right? No, I mean, but this integrates what's currently happening and projects it like a war game mm -hmm. over a worst-case scenario of something that could happen, and then you just back it off a little bit and you know, hope it doesn't happen. And people, but people watch the news differently, I find. They read the news differently because now they're seeing connections of things that they didn't know were necessarily significant that maybe now are. Mm -hmm. Now, why the vice president, the secretary of state, CIA directors, governors, 
generals. Why they read them, I don't know. Because these guys are read in to the worst, most dangerous things in the world. But I think a, a political thriller is different from intelligence because it has emotion and it has resolution. It has character and plot formation. And it takes you on a roller coaster ride. It, it, you, know, you strap in and you start, you start racing. And that's different from intelligence, where you're not quite sure where this is going to go and what you're supposed to do. So is there a third to this? There is. I'm writing it, uh, not as we speak, but... Uh, okay, I'm going I'm to make an appeal that you give Marcus a day off. Yes, well, he's, he's got a broken nose at the end of uh, one book and a broken rib. And he, I want him to be a character that, uh, that gets injured, um, that gets scarred. You know, I love Tom Cruise in these movies, but... Bless his heart, he, you know, he's never injured. You, you think, really? Really, you just went flying off a motorcycle at 70 miles an hour? You're not getting anything here? I mean, you can live. Okay, I'll buy that. But, uh, and I, you know, in, in previous books, I have killed off main characters. I have killed off friends, family. Oh, you, um, you, you're, you do I, some killing in this I, book, there, too. I don't want you to know who's going to die. Don't get, don't because, get you attached uh, to some of them. Because that's unfortunately real life. So I want to know, is Joel Rosenberg a character in any of these books? Is oh, he's he a character. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well. Yes. Well. Oh, sorry. Uh, just had to get the Reagan impression in there just for a second. Um, no, I, I, yeah, I'm a character, but no, not in these books. These are, these are people that are interesting. Like, I, I, <laughs> I, I okay. have a vantage point to see. Are you the Marcus wannabe? No, look, Marcus is a, a combination of, of several of my sons. I have four sons. Um, and in the book, uh, so several of my sons and a nephew. And these guys, these kids are crazy. I mean, I, you know, w somehow my wife Lynn and I did not get the, the spiritual gift of raising teenage daughters. Okay, we, we got four sons. Great. Uh, daughters can be crazy too. Well, so I'll just bless so their hearts, but the Lord looked at us and went, I don't think you two can handle that. <laughs> it's much harder, I'm told. But... For us, so boy, so it's, it's stitches and it's broken bones and it's, you know, all the rest and it's craziness. Like, whoa, whoa, gentlemen. So I have a son who's now in Israeli special forces, uh, two, two sons in the Israeli army now, but one's in special forces. And I, we used to say to him the line that's in the Kremlin conspiracy and the Persian gamble that's spoken by the mother to Marcus, which is don't, don't die, die and, and don't, don't get, get arrested. arrested. Like that's your objective to get through high school. Like when you get in the army, They'll teach you how to go to the craziest limit. They'll back it off a nudge, and that's what it means to be in special forces. That's a good thing. But for right now, you're insane, and you've got to just you've got to dial so it back. So you answered my question. Don't don't die and don't get arrested. Yeah, I'm not in there, but but I you know I, I scavenge from everything, and uh, I think that I would also say uh, so. Yeah, that these guys are doing really interesting things, and I don't. But but. I don't know that there are, yeah, currently, I'm not sure if there are political thriller writers um, who deal with the Middle East, for example, who have had the opportunity to sit with the Saudi crown prince for hours, the UAE crown prince. I, I, uh, I have not Egyptian heard of any, Egyptian president, which is why I was... the, you know, the king, yeah. That's, and so while I'm not a former somebody, right? Most people who do things, they're a, they did, you know, they, they were a former... A CIA agent, or they were, you know, I mean, John le Carre at least was in the intelligence services in Britain. Um, but you seem to have a lot of close friends in I these have friends organizations. And they are willing to tell me things and not kill me, and that's good. <laughs> and you do pick up a lot of atmospherics, uh, being in a palace, being in a motorcade. And of course, if you get to talk about the Iran threat in real time with the very current leaders who are dealing with the Iran threat, mm -hmm. um, that makes, I think it makes for an interesting series of political thrillers, but, uh, um, but well, no, I'm not really in these things, because I don't have, you know, I told my kids, if we move to Israel and become citizens of Israel, you know, you'll get drafted in the army, but dad is old, overweight, blind as a bat, flat-footed, the only reason they would draft me is to be a hostage, you know, <laughs> so I'm not going to be living the Marcus Riker life, it's just not in the cards for me. Do you, uh, you have a lot of fans here. Do you, out of all the books you've written, do you have a favorite? My favorite is always the one that's on sale now, selling for the most. <laughs> that would be this one. But, 
I do like this one. I'm learning as I go. I, I had never, I mean, I had never, not only had I had never written a novel prior to The Last Jihad, I, I don't even like fiction. <laughs> I, don't, I don't find it that interesting. Uh, I don't read much fiction. I'm reading more now because I'm curious about different styles. And, you know, I, uh, I loved Clancy. And, of course, Tom Clancy had the ultimate political thriller fantasy where you write your first novel. You've never been on a submarine. I don't think he'd ever seen a submarine. But he writes a novel, and President Ronald Reagan loved the book. Walks, I think he walked out to, to uh, Marine One holding it. I don't, uh, not, maybe, maybe I made that up. But um, tells everybody that he loves it, and it becomes huge. Like, and that is a fun thing. Um, I love Vince Flynn. Um, I've been reading some Brad Thor recently. But I just, fiction is, uh, the world is too interesting. And I don't find fiction usually that interesting. Mm-hmm. So... I don't remember what your question was, but that was my... Uh, <laughs> which one of your books yeah, which is one your favorite? favorite? So, I, so I'm learning as I go. That, that's the, that was the point. And uh, I think, though, actually, that my favorite is the one novel that's completely different from every other one. I did write a, an historical fictional account uh, called The Auschwitz Escape. And that was based on a trip that I'd taken to Auschwitz, Auschwitz with several uh, evangelical leaders... Um, I had never been. I tend to try to avoid the Holocaust as a topic. It's too personal. But I went, and, um, and in the research, I began... I wasn't planning to do a book. I just wanted to go visit. But in, there's, a, there's a little bookshop just as you're leaving the, the Birkenau expansion camp. And we were getting ready to head back to Krakow, and there was a little book there that I saw. It was called... Um, London has been informed. Thin little paperback, but it dealt with there were more than 800 escape attempts from the Auschwitz-Birkenau uh, death camp. And I didn't... And, and, and over 800 attempts and only a handful of successful es- escapes. And I thought... And your book the, is based on one of those the, successful... Yeah, exactly. And I didn't... And I had, they didn't even talk about it. We hired a VIP guide to take us through and tell us everything. He never mentioned that anybody got out. And, and these people, there was four of them, actually. It was two sets of two escapes. And they wanted to get out, not just to save their own lives, but to specifically warn Churchill and FDR, this is what's happening in these camps. You don't know it, but this is what's really happening. People are being liquidated. And I decided... And, the, and your characters got out the same way that they did exactly, in real life. Exactly. So I, I thought I could write another nonfiction about it, book about it, but there are nonfiction books, and... People haven't read them. Mm-hmm. So I went to the, uh, to the Israeli um, Holocaust Memorial Museum Research Center called Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. And I asked them, listen, I'm thinking of writing a th- novel, but I don't, you know, I know that the Iranian leadership thinks that the entire Holocaust is fiction. So I don't want to get, I don't want to trip into something where I'm encouraging the idea that the Holocaust is fiction. They said, no, no, no. We, many people have written about the Holocaust as fiction because it's a way to help people capture the emotion of it, not just the magnitude of what happened. It's a challenge to do it in a way that honors what really happened. You've got to be fastidious about detail. But there's a way of taking people in to that world and helping them emotionally understand. And so they were very helpful in, uh, in it. And we're, we're talking to producers right now. There, there's interest in possibly making it a movie or maybe a a Netflix or Amazon miniseries. Uh, of course, that has happened over the time, and it doesn't end up mm-hmm. coming to fruition, so we don't hold our breath. But that book, I, it was the most painful topic, and yet I probably put more passion and care into that story. Mm-hmm. And I would love it. If, if that was the only movie that ever got made from my books, that would be the one I would it, want. It is yeah. tremendous. I highly recommend it. I, I listened to it on Audible. Is that right? Driving to and from work, and... Um, I'm going to tell you, I did have to pull over one time. Mm. I, I was too emotional and realized that wasn't very safe. Um, okay. So, wow. uh, but I do recommend it um, probably after you read this one, which you can get here tonight. So, <laughs> um, we are going to go to some questions in the audience. I hope you have been preparing them. But one that 
uh, before we do that, you know, we're in the House of Reagan here. Yes, I'm so honored. And really I thought we thing. could bring him into the conversation just a little bit. Uh, you wrote in the Ezekiel option that Ronald Reagan was fascinated with the Old Testament That's and the right. coming war of Gog and Magog. Right. I know from personal experience that Ronald Reagan was a very spiritual man. He read the Bible quite a bit. It was part of his daily routine. But I'm wondering where you heard the story and uh, and do you think it's true? And, and can you give me some context? Oh, wow, well, it's a quiz. That's fun. Uh, by the executive director or the chief of staff of the entire uh, Reagan Library. Wow, okay. So, all right, there's a prophecy in the Old Testament, book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39, what is famously known as the War of Gog and Magog, where it is believed that Russia, Iran, Turkey, and a group of other countries will form an alliance and come to surround and attack Israel, try to consume Israel in what the Bible calls, quote unquote, the last days. Well, this has intrigued me. My family escaped out of Russia uh, in the early years of the 1900s as, as Orthodox Jews. We have since come to faith in Jesus as Messiah, so we're evangelicals. Uh, so the prophecy, Israel, Russia, Iran, oh my goodness, it's, it's like a convergence of my interests. Now, I had studied that prophecy for years, uh, from uh, reading everything I could find from Bible scholars. But I, found, I used to find it in, in some... Um, in some I, I was curious what other people learned and I, uh, or had said about it. And I began reading that President Reagan, as governor, and probably before, but I read it as governor, was curious about Bible prophecy. He was very interested in the book of Revelation, which I think spooked some people um, at, when he was so president with the finger on the button, as it were. How, you know, should you really be reading about the book of Revelation? This is uh, probably why he liked Tom Clancy's book, uh, Hunt for Red October, because there's a very scene in the novel and in, in the movie where somebody is saying to the to Captain Ramius, uh, should a man in your position really be reading about the end of the world? But the answer is yes. Of course they should be. They should understand, uh, you know, that, that there is evil in this world. Even if they're not acting in a, in a tactical or policy manner, they should certainly know the Bible. So all that to say, the more I read about Reagan, I got especially focused on, what, on, his, on his curiosity about prophecy. And lo and behold, um, in Edmund Morris's biography, uh, official authorized biography, he writes uh, several times about the relation about Reagan's interest in prophecy, specifically about Gog and Magog. That as governor, he once uh, gave a speech about it, um, and and then he writes that there was an Oval Office meeting where, as I, if I remember correctly, it's uh, Jim Baker, who I believe is his. I'm not sure if it was chief of staff or treasury secretary at that moment, and Colin Powell. Mm -hmm. And they're talking, and Reagan says, well, gentlemen, have you ever talked, have you ever been interested in this prophecy of Gog and Magog? And he starts explaining it to them. And they are freaked <laughs> out. Like, that did not, this was not just like, oh, he's, you know, let's have some jelly beans and talk about something new and interesting. <laughs> that really spooked them. I mean, that, and, they, and maybe they were the type of people to be, spooked by that, and I just say that because it, it didn't sound like the thing a president should be thinking about, but I disagree. He was a well-read, I mean, I never met him, that was great sadness, regret to that, but he, he was so fascinated in so many things, including the things of the Bible, and um, so when I wrote my first nonfiction book, Epicenter, I actually included some of those uh, anecdotes oh. in the book because... Uh, the Gog and Magog thing has a lot of uh, currency. People are, there's, a, there's a subculture of people who are curious about it. Not that people teach about it much and talk about it, but there's a curiosity. And when you watch a Russian-Iranian alliance actually forming with Turkey and the others, you think, hmm, well, maybe that's not crazy. Maybe that's really going to happen one day. One day. So that's my uh, Reagan connection to Well, we prophecy. do have some questions. And I saw a hand go up right here in the front in pink right here. Emily? Will you wait until you have the microphone to ask the question so that we can capture it on our live stream? Hi. Hi. I have a question. You mentioned Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Yes. Have you ever considered or are you considering writing something about the China threat? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, China is a growing threat, uh, a very serious threat. And, 
And China's complicated because in some ways, in, in my view, in recent years, we have not seen um, the type of aggression yet from them that they're certainly capable of and that they're building towards. You see Russia actually, you know, seizing 20% of Georgia and holding on to it, or Crimea, or the eastern uh, provinces of, uh, of Ukraine, the, the Donbass region. Um, you see them threatening. You see them sending forces into to, to seize part of uh, Syria and prop up Assad's genocidal regime. You see them working with Iran. And, so, and, and you see North Korea building their nuclear arsenal. But, but with China, they're, they're, their aggression primarily at the moment is internal, and they are really crushing uh, uh, Uyghur Muslims. They're, they're crushing Christians, to be sure. After a season where they were letting up a little bit, now they've turned the other direction. And of course, they're building out the, these islands. They're trying to build bases on these islands to cut off uh, these straits. So uh, I am, I'm not there yet. And my interest is primarily the Middle East. I went to the Kremlin conspiracy because I needed a change of pace and because I believe that Putin is so dangerous that I needed to draw some attention uh, to him, um, from my, at least among my readers. But China will definitely play a role, and I'm trying to figure out what role, and probably in this series. Uh, I think Marcus Riker may go on for a bit. Uh, I'm enjoying him as a character. Um, it doesn't mean I won't kill him off, but it, it, <laughs> I always thought, how, you know, shouldn't Jack Bauer or Jason Bourne at some point, two thirds of the way through a film, not make it? Like, that would be sad, but it would be realistic. Um, anyway, uh, that's my long-winded way of saying I haven't figured out how to put China into it yet, but that's what I'm working on. Yeah. We're going to go over here. Hi, you've alluded to how you do research in the past. You find a book, and you read it, and then you talk to people. Um, right now, you, you say you chat with leaders. But you really haven't told us, like, do you watch TV shows? What kind of, how do you do research currently? Because you seem very well informed. Thank you, I appreciate it. Well, again, I, 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 the key to me in writing a political thriller is the what if premise. You've got to be able to say in a sentence or no more than a paragraph, the premise that's chilling and untrue but could be true enough that hooks people. And that's what I start with. So even through the rest of my year, even when I'm not writing, I'm constantly thinking and, and scanning and listening and talking to people. I do. I sit down. I've got, I'm friends now because of the novels with three former directors of the Central Intelligence Agency. I was with one a few weeks ago, and I sit with him. He reads the book. This, is, this happens to be Porter Goss. Um, and he was a former chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, then was George W. Bush's uh, CIA director. So he reads. The, he and his wife read the book in advance. I come to their house. It's a lovely home, and we sit on uh, on the the water's edge in Florida, and they critique the new novel, and they give me good critiques because they've read it and they know. And then we talk about the future. What keeps you up? What do you worry about? So I do that with a lot of people. What worries you? What keeps you up? And um, and then I fill in a lot. Yeah, yeah. I love. I, I mean, yes, I do watch television, but I watch more Seinfeld. Uh, then, uh, you know, again, I don't find commercial entertainment that interesting. I do like to watch movies. I like to watch thrillers. I love the new Israeli series, Fauda, um, except that my, my kids are now living it, so that's uh, additionally terrifying. But generally, I'm more interested in, in the nonfiction and absorbing that and then, and then projecting out, wow, where could that lead, uh, than I am sort of absorbing... Um, Do you read newspapers movies? every day? Yeah, I'm not, not as a physical newspaper, but uh, online. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely. And mm -hmm. I'm tracking what's happening all the time. Um, My question was really, do you watch CNN or Fox? Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. Um, no, I, I, you know, I do. Um, I do watch uh, Fox and CNN and MSNBC. And even MSNBC is still there. And... Um, <laughs> Bless their hearts, right? Uh, no, but I, I, I like, in fact, when I'm doing that, I often, I'm more often 
to wa- more likely to watch people I don't agree with to understand their, their worldview. Um, and because I find them interesting characters, and I think, hmm, that, that person is interesting. I, maybe they should be a character in one of my novels. Uh, <laughs> I don't usually actually f- create a character based on a specific person. I have done that a few times. Those but, are the ones uh, that don't live very long. They're composites. Well, <laughs> they're, they're, they're more composites, because I don't want to get sued, you know, but uh, anyway. All right, we have oh. another question right here. Hi. Um, I follow your blog, and I was wondering, do you think um, Israel will be um, attacked by Iran and Russia in our lifetime? Well, uh, I don't know. Um, that is certainly the, the premise of, of, the, of the prophecy. So I believe the prophecy. I believe it will come true. And, of course, the, that prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, what we just spoke about, it comes after, as you might note, Ezekiel 36 and 37. Well, what are those about? Those are the famous prophecies about Israel being reborn as a geopolitical entity, Jews pouring back into the land of Israel after centuries of exile, rebuilding the ancient ruins, you know, and becoming a a secure and prosperous country. Well, the last 70 years, almost 71 now, that's exactly what we've seen happen. And my family is is living, we are part of the slipstream, the, the movement of a prophetic history. So uh, is it possible that the next set of events w- could happen in my lifetime? It could. But, you know, I think you can believe that as a, as a devout uh, follower of Christ and a believer in the Bible, um, but you can't live, you can't base your life on whether that'll happen today or tomorrow or the next day, right? So I, I did write a political thr- thriller series that imagined if that, if that happened in our lifetime, how might it happen? That's the last jihad, last days, the Ezekiel option, Copper Scroll, and Dead Heat. That's the first series I wrote because of my fascination with the prophecies. Um, whether it'll happen, I don't know. I, you know. You'd have to be a lunatic to say, oh, I, I know, because I, I, I don't know. But let me just say one thing about writing novels and... and, and uh, so that series deals with prophecy. Some of the others do, not all of mine do. But I will say this, in that prophecy, which I find so fascinating, um, Iraq is not mentioned as one of the coalition enemies against Israel, right? And Iraq is not a term that's ever in the Bible, but the, but the names that were in the Bible for Iraq, Mesopotamia, Babel, Babylon, Babylonia, Shinar, none of them are used. Now, when I began writing this thriller, I want to imagine what if it happened in my lifetime. What if? Not that it will, but what if? But my challenge in, in January of 2001 was, if I write a thriller that feels like it could happen tomorrow, what do I do with Saddam Hussein? Because if, if Iraq is not part of the prophecy, then what, Saddam's not going to sign up and go, wait, you're trying to kill Jews, annihilate Jews? I'm in, I'm in, I'm there. What is he at, you know, Club Med for the weekend? Or, what, you know, he misses the whole thing? No. So I had, I had to back up the story, and I thought, well, I have to eliminate Saddam Hussein in some geopolitically plausible scenario before I can write the rest of the series. And that's how I ended up writing Last Jihad. But then I woke up the, after that book was successful and thought, oh, well, what do I do with Yasser Arafat? Because Israel is described as living securely in the land prior to these events of Russia and Iran. Well, with Yasser Arafat around, he, they were not going to be living securely. So I had to get rid of them. <laughs> so that was, that was book number two. And then I was ready to deal with, and that was just fiction, but he did die within 12 months of that novel coming out. <laughs> and that's why US News and World Report described me as a modern Nostradamus. But I'm not. I want to be clear. I'm not predicting that my that the events in my novels are going to come true. I'm not. Everybody says that I am. I think you said that I am, and most people feel that way. But it's actually not the objective. Yeah, I believe Bible prophecy is going to happen, but I'm not predicting that what I write will happen. I'm writing about things that could happen. But I want you to feel like... you're so close, though. Yeah, I want you to feel like they could happen. And the test is not only if you buy it, the test is whether you curse me on Twitter at 6 o'clock in the morning when you've been up all night thinking, I'll just read one more chapter, just, you know, one more chapter. 
and now you've got to go to work, right, or school, and you're furious with me. I love these emails. They're so colorful. And uh, from unbelievers, they're very colorful. From the Christians, they're like, oh, you're so terrible. Bless your heart. That's sort of the way, that's the way Christians say it. But I know what they mean. And, uh, and that's fun. So anyway, my friends from Texas, they know what I'm talking about. Hashtag bless your heart. So anyway, the, that's the objective. You know, All right, so. we have one question right here. Uh, yes, in your previous life, you were a political consultant. Uh, well, yeah, such as, you know, as it was. And you were consulted for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Right. What do you believe? Is he guilty of what they're accusing him of now? Do you think he'll be reelected? Uh, well, um, what do you say about uh, him? okay, so I, I, I'm not a personal friend of his. I haven't seen him in, in a decade personally, right? So I just want to be... I, um, I, I admire what Prime Minister Netanyahu has done as a, as a leader. Um, I don't know. I give him the, the, the legal presumption of innocence. But I will say he has been indicted on three separate corruption cases. And his wife has been indicted on a fourth case that's completely separate. These are not three counts of one case. It's three separate cases and then hers. And it's not by an enemy. This is, his, this is Netanyahu's hand-chosen uh, attorney general, right? It's, it's a friend of his. So, uh, and the man took a year to sift through all the evidence that the police gave him and then make a decision. So I think he's in, he's in, he's in severe legal jeopardy. But he's in two other jeopardies too, real quickly. He, he's in political jeopardy because he's right now, his, his party, the Likud party, is losing in the polls to the centrist, very new party called Blue and White. So there's a possibility his team won't even have the plurality of seats, therefore he won't get a chance to build a coalition, somebody else will. That's number two. But there's a third one. The third jeopardy is that he does squeak out the victory. He is in theory able to make a, uh, a, a political coalition, a governing coalition after April 9th. But it's possible that some of his coalition members say, look, Bibi, we love you and we are sure that you're innocent. But you've got to go defend yourself and your wife on four different corruption cases. Like, we can't serve with you if you've got to spend so much of your day thinking about defending yourself instead of the country, because it's a big deal. So if even one or possibly two of those party leaders say, we can't sit with a, an indicted sitting prime minister, then he can't put together a coalition. So he's got a lot of challenges. And... Um, but I wish him well. I, 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 I admire him. I think he's done an amazing job defending Israel and opening doors to China, to India, to Brazil, to sub-Saharan Africa, to the Arab world. We are more likely to make a peace treaty with the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Omanis in the next few years than the Palestinian leadership. So, and this is in large part because of Netanyahu's leadership. We also have unemployment under 4%. Uh, we have, you know, rocket attacks, but really it's the safest country in the region, safest for Christians in the region, safest for Muslims in the region, uh, and we're getting record tourism every year. That's pretty good. Uh, that's why he's been reelected so often. But, boy, all bets are off. I have no idea what's going to happen, um, and I'm Does he landing have... in the country on April 9th from this oh. six-week book tour, and I'm not sure exactly how it's going to play out. Does he have an obvious successor? No, he does not like, he, he's not a disciple maker. He doesn't, he, he, all the leaders of the other center-right parties are former chiefs of staff of his, that he, they, they, they argue that he frustrates them, exasperates them so much that they leave him, start their own party, win four or five or six or seven seats, and then he has to deal with them, maybe not as an equal, but at least as a partner. Uh, so the entire center-right is led by people who, are deeply frustrated with him. He is not a person, he's not a person who has built uh, intentionally a successor. Now, he, I think he has built a lot of excellent people, but they just don't like him anymore. So <laughs> there are some that like him too. I mean, he, but he's a, you know, he's a tough guy to work with. He's sort of like, you know, I mean, with respect. I mean, I, these are leaders, right? I, I mean, Reagan was one of the few people who could, you know, be so strong and so tough, but also so winsome. Right? I mean, you have someone like Speaker Newt Gingrich, right? There's, there's genius Newt, the strategically fascinating Newt, and then there's, oh my gosh, you really be kidding me, Newt, you know? And there's, <laughs> Bibi Netanyahu is a little bit like that, so. 
Well, have we have time for, for one more question, and it's back here. Make it a good one. Well, I hope it is. Um, you've notably come to Christ as a, a Jewish person, and I've just been reading about Rabbi Kadori and how his final prophecy was met with great consternation in Israel. Do you think that that will change, that more people in Israel will see Jesus as the Messiah? Well, that's a fun question to get asked at the Ronald Reagan <laughs> Presidential Library. I, I don't know this person, but I love her already. I mean, um, that's not a plant. But uh, look, at that question um, is an interesting one. I'm going to answer it in, in, in two ways, since it's the last question. First, um, uh, it's my favorite question in the world, how can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus? Now, I love and respect all my you know, Jewish world, Israeli world friends who don't see the world the way I do it. Uh, they, they see the Bible the way I do it. They don't see Jesus the way I do. But it is exciting that there are now, uh, there was a new report out last year, there are 871,000 Jewish followers of Jesus in the United States alone now. When I was born in 1967, there were fewer than 2,000 in the entire world. So we've gone from 2,000 to almost 900,000 in 52 years. In Israel, we've gone from 23 Jewish followers of Jesus as Messiah in 1948, 23, to 30,000 now. So those are increases, not as big in Israel as here, but it's still, it's still hard for many people to, to get it. When I, when I was uh, in the Oval Office, um, the first thing that happened when I sat down, he didn't ask me about the book, and he didn't ask me, he, what he said, what the president said was, so the vice president tells me that you are an evangelical leader in the United States. I mean, one of them. And I said, well, I, I'm an evangelical. I let other people decide, what, you know. They said, he said, but your name is Joel Rosenberg. <laughs> Isn't that Jewish? I said, yes, it is Jewish. Uh, it's Jewish on my father's side. My mom's not Jewish. He says, well, how, so how... But you're an evangelical. I said, I know. I'm a Jewish person who believes that Jesus is the Messiah, and, and I'm an evangelical. So he goes, well, isn't that confusing for your Israeli friends? <laughs> I said, well, and for my Arab friends, too. <laughs> uh, but it's all, I said, Mr. President, it's always the basis of a very interesting conversation uh, wherever I go. And who knew that it would be happening in the Oval Office? Look, I, I, and I, I'll th- close with this. I, I, um, one of the things I loved about President Reagan, again, from a distance, I was, I was young. Uh, I think I was 13 when he was elected. So uh, I, one of the things I loved about him was I, I, I believe he was a man of deep faith. Um, it was challenging, him, obviously, to go to church because of the Secret Service and the assassination attempt. And those, I, I'm not, it's not clear to me that he and his wife saw the, the world on, in this area the same way. I don't know, but that's my impression. But obviously they loved each other. But one of the things that I loved about President Reagan and that is so missing from our society today is the ability to hold strong, principled views and be friendly and winsome. I believe a lot of that came from being Irish, (laughs) but I also think, and from his family and his upbringing, but I also think part of that was his faith, to love your neighbor. And... One of the things that is challenging in our world today is, is holding deep convictions and advancing your convictions without being a creep. You know, that you would be able to strongly disagree with someone, but like he and Tip O'Neill, you know, end the day with a, with a drink and a, and a, and a laugh and a, and a joke. Uh, one of, my, one of my, the favorite things I'm doing now is this relationship with, that's happening with the Sunni Arab leaders. Uh, um, we, we obviously disagree theologically. We disagree on some political issues, but, but there's a common ground and we're, trying, and we're, building, a, we're building friendships. And that's true. It's even more challenging, actually, in the Jewish world. Because when you're a follower of Jesus and you're Jewish, to some you are radioactive. You are a betrayer of your people. Except that Jesus himself was Jewish. All his disciples were Jewish. He's the most famous Jewish person in all of human history. He did write the number one best-selling book of all time. (laughs) I mean, it was ghost-written, but still. Um, So anyway, um, that's a little bit of my faith and and how I weave some of it 
into my novels. But I, I guess that's the last thought. To write a political thriller and, and compete with all the best-selling political thrillers and writers in the country is very challenging. When you take out uh, sexual scenes and coarse language, you're at a disadvantage against uh, all your friends and, and competitors. When you try to weave in a spiritual theme, <laughs> now you've just gone crazy. But uh, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do, and somehow I made it to the Ronald Reagan Library, so I'm very, very grateful. Well, Joanne, well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Joel has 